Often crowded with tourists, Ephesus is a must-see stop on any trip itinerary through western Turkey. Few archaeological sites in Turkey are as impressive as Ephesus. In fact, with the possible exception of Pompeii, one could argue that it is the world's finest surviving example of a Greco-Roman classical city. After more than a century and a half of excavation, the city's recovered and renovated structures bear eloquent testimony to this important and grand city of ancient Asia Minor. And that's with 80% of the city yet to be unearthed. Strolling the streets of Ephesus, past fountains, statues, monuments, temples, a great library, residences, the Agora and the theater, the modern visitor can easily imagine the ancient city thronged with crowds engaged in the various activities of their society. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ in Turkey. Ephesus was a vibrant city of over 250,000 inhabitants, the fourth largest in the empire after Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Add in traders, sailors, and pilgrims to the Temple of Artemis, and these numbers would swell. In Ephesus, one could encounter the full diversity of the Mediterranean world and its peoples. So important and wealthy was Ephesus that its Temple of Artemis on the western edge of present-day Selchuk uh, was the biggest on the earth, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. A visit to ancient Ephesus should include time to visit several associated sites, such as the Museum, the House of Mary, the Basilica of St. John, the Temple of Artemis, and the Cave of the Seven Sleepers. The Basilica of St. John was constructed in the 6th century by Justinian I and is believed to be standing in the exact site where John, the author of the Book of Revelation and the Gospel of John, was buried. The entire structure of the Basilica was modeled from the current Church of the Holy Apostles that is located in Constantinople. The city was the home of the many-breasted goddess of fertility Artemis, or Diana, whom all of the Asian and the world fanatically worshipped. Her image was believed to have fallen down from heaven. The magnificent temple devoted to the goddess was the pride of the citizen of Ephesus. It was reckoned among the wonders of the ancient world. The inner shrine of the Temple of Diana was a safety deposit for an enormous number of valuables from all over the Mediterranean and beyond. This made the temple one of the most important financial centers in the ancient world. William Barclay says the temple possessed the right of asylum, that is to say, if any man committed a crime, if he could reach the precincts of the temple before he was arrested, he was safe. That immunity extended to an area of one bow shot or 200 yards all around the temple. Thus, the temple housed the choicest collection of criminals in the ancient world. Only the foundation and one column remain of this temple, which probably measured 115 meters long, 55 meters wide, and 18 meters high. Located in Selichuk, the Ephesus Museum exhibits many spectacular finds from the excavations at Ephesus and the surrounding area. 
With nine galleries reorganized after a massive renovation, the Ephesus Museum contains artifacts from Ephesus terraced houses and the Temple of Artemis, including scales, jewelry, and cosmetic boxes, as well as coins, funerary goods, and ancient statuary. The famous terracotta effigy of the phallic god Priapus is in Gallery 2, and most of Gallery 4 is given over to Eros in sculpted form. The two multi-breasted marble statues of Artemis in Gallery 8 are very fine works. Finds from a gladiator's cemetery are displayed here too, with commentary on the weaponry, training regimes and occupational hazards. Also worth seeing is the frieze from the Temple of Hadrian in Gallery 9, which is devoted to the imperial cult. This shows four heroic Amazons with their breasts cut off. Early Greek writers attributed the founding of Ephesus to them. Ephesus is believed to be the city of the seven sleepers. The story of these seven sleepers, who are considered saints by Catholics and Orthodox Christians, and whose story is also mentioned in the Quran, tells that they were persecuted because of their monotheist belief in God and that they slept in a cave near Ephesus for centuries. The main site of the ancient city of Ephesus has two entrances, one at the north end of the site, the lower entrance, and the other at the southeast edge of the site, the upper entrance. Walking the upper entrance of the city through the Magnesia Gate, you'll be astounded by amazing sights. Grooves made by chariot wheels, streets made of marble that lead to wonderful temples, fountains, as well as porticos and frescoes in luxurious terrace houses. Touring the three-story Celsus Library that housed a total of 12,000 scrolls, the Odeon, a small theater, the Temple of Hadrian, devoted to the worship of the emperor, Curate Street, the main path, the magnificent Trajan Fountain, as well as the Grand Theater, originally holding 25,000 people. Ephesus City is proof and testimony of the greatness and prominence of ancient civilization. Pergamon was the official capital of the province of Asia, but Ephesus was by far its greatest city. It claimed the proud title, the first and the greatest metropolis of Asia. The Christian church in Ephesus, at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, was probably the most influential Christian church in the province. It was the church founded by Aquila and Priscilla and the young preacher Apollos. Paul worked in Ephesus for about three years and he addressed the letter which we know today as Ephesians to this church. It was in this city that some of the greatest victories of the gospel were won. In spite of the city's notorious reputation, the church in Ephesus grew rapidly. Later, Timothy and John, the apostles, spent a great deal of time in ministry there. G.R. Beasley Murray notes, It is comprehensible that teachers of many kinds and of every shade of doctrine were drawn to Ephesus to seek the patronage of the church and to influence its ways. Barclay makes an interesting observation. Sometimes we say that it is hard to be a Christian in a modern, industrial, competitive civilization. Let us remember Ephesus and let us remember that there were Christians there. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent, 
and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. John begins the letters to the seven churches with Ephesus, the nearest church to Patmos of all the seven cities. Ephesus was located only 100 kilometers from Patmos. It is appropriate that the first letter should be sent there. It was the most important city of the province of Asia. If the traditions about John are correct, his heart rate would have quickened as he heard that the first of the seven letters was destined for the church at Ephesus, since it is widely believed that he himself was a bishop there for many years. In the letter, the church is praised for its orthodoxy, chided for its failure to love, and challenged to repent and return to its original high ground. In this letter, it is clear that Christ is intimately concerned with his followers and cares for them, like he cares for you. Each letter is introduced with a description of Jesus, which relates directly to the problem of the church. And each description of Christ is drawn from the details given in the preview vision John recorded in the first chapter of Revelation. This links the whole narration together. In the letter to Ephesus, Jesus holds the seven stars, the leaders of the churches, and walks among the seven golden lampstands, the seven churches of Asia Minor. The words hold and walk in the Greek are both present active participles, indicating that the action of the Lord is continual. The verb kriteo has uh, the nuance of not merely holding, but also grasping or exercising power, whereas peripateo gives the sense of walking about. It means that Christ lives among his earthly church, with his people, and that he has complete control over the church. If the church submits to that control, it will never go wrong. And more than that, our security lies in the fact that we are in the right hand of Christ. Thus, is fulfill His promise to be with these disciples, to be with them, always, even unto the end of the world. For this reason, you and I can rest in peace knowing that Christ is with us, holding and sustaining us each step of the way. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in His teaching in our past history. As one who walks in the midst of the churches, Christ is able to say, I know your deeds. These are the first words to each church. His admonition is that of one who is fully acquainted with the problems of each church and who is therefore able to recommend an appropriate and effective solution. Their deeds, Christ knows, are not so much separate acts as they are an overall manner of life. Jesus knows all about the hard work and perseverance of the Ephesians. Jesus mentions both of the active and passive sides of their lifestyle. The Ephesians had toiled to the point of exhaustion and had patiently borne the hostility of a society at odds with their goals and efforts. In the same way, the exalted Christ knows what goes on among his people. He knows what goes on with you and me. Nothing passes unnoticed before him. He loves and cares about you. Jesus' appraisal of the church in Ephesus is very positive. The church is praised for great qualities, exhausting hard work and patience. The members there have not grown weary. They bear up under all kinds of pressure for the sake of Christ's name. That is to say, they have persevered for the sake of the purity of the message they preach. The church is doctrinally sound. It does not tolerate evil men and tests those who call themselves apostles and they are not. It hates the practices of the Nicolaitans. 
a tradition having the support of some of the early church fathers, identifies the Nicolaitans with the followers of Nicholas, who was one of the seven men selected to serve the church in Acts 6, verse 5, but later became a heretical teacher. This heretical group advocated Christian compromise and promoted the view to their fellow Christians that there is nothing wrong with a prudent conformity to the pagan practices. The Christians in Asia were evidently divided on the issue of conforming to society. Involvement in the pagan religious festivals in Asia called for a compromise of Christian faith and beliefs. On one side were those who obediently followed the decision of the Council of Jerusalem to abstain from the food offered to idols and the practice of cultic prostitution obligatory for all citizens. On the other side were those who advocated compromise. Such permissive teaching and misconduct were typical characteristics of the Balaamites in Pergamum and the wicked woman Jezebel in the church of Thyatira who caused Christians to practice immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It could be that the Nicolaitans and those who hold the teachings of Balaam and Jezebel refer to three groups of false teachers with the same permissive teaching of compromise, who were thus doing much harm to the local congregations in Asia. All of these indicates, as Barclay suggests, that Nicolaitans likely thought that Christians are freed from all law and can live as they wish. They perverted the teaching of Paul and turn Christian liberty into Christian license. Christ's rebuke of this church is expressed in one memorable phrase, you have forsaken your first love. This indicates that their first love for Christ and the gospel had been disappearing. The initial members of the church in Ephesus were known for their faith in the Lord Jesus and their ardent love for all the saints. But what characterized the religion of the church in the beginning was now lacking. The enthusiasm was gone and the members were starting to lose touch with God and love for one another. Religion in the church of Ephesus became legalistic and loveless. Every virtue carries within itself the seeds of its own destruction. It seems probable that the desire for sound teaching and the resulting action taken to exclude all impostors had created a climate of suspicion in which love within the believing community could no longer exist. Unfortunately, the history of the Christian church has all too many instances of unholy zeal in the pursuit of truth. Good works and pure doctrine are not adequate substitutes for that rich relationship of mutual love shared by those who have experienced for the first time the redemptive love of God. The Ephesian church had forsaken its first love. Whatever the sin, it requires repentance. Indeed, all of the churches except Smyrna and Philadelphia are called to repentance. It is possible to slip away gradually without realizing what's happening. Christ counsels them to go back in thought to the first days. The Greek imperative literally means keep on remembering, hold in memory. They had enjoyed a close walk with God. Let their minds dwell on that. The second counsel is to repent. The Greek heiress points to a sharp break with evil. Christians should never dally with wrong. There must be a sharp break with it. Christ's third imperative is to do the things you did at first, the works that had issued from their first love. The love that Jesus requires is an attitude toward the brethren that expresses itself in loving acts. promises the overcomer the privilege of eating from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Just as the opening description of Christ in each case echoes the vision in Revelation 1, 13 to 16, so this and many of the overcomer's promises anticipate these catological visions later in the book. There are two very beautiful ideas for the overcomers. 
Firstly, there is the idea of the Tree of Life. This is part of the story of the Garden of Eden. In the middle of the garden, there was the Tree of Life. But after Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out of Eden, so they would not have access to the Tree of Life. The second is the idea of paradise. The very sound of the word is lovely. The paradise of God in Revelation symbolizes the eschatological state in which God and people are restored to that perfect fellowship which existed before the entrance of sin into the world. The overcomer in Ephesus is promised a permanent home in the restored Eden in which he or she will share the gift of eternal life which Adam and Eve enjoyed before the entrance of sin into the world. How is your love, your love for God and for one another? Is it possible that you, like the church at Ephesus, have forsaken your first love? Zeal without love leads to legalism. However, love without zeal is indifference. Those who follow Christ's example and live out his teachings will have both love and zeal interconnected and inseparable. And this leads to Christ-likeness. Maybe you have submitted to a different temptation. Maybe you've been listening to voices which have led you to compromise your principles. You've said yes when you should have run. Sin, no matter its color or name, is still sin and it requires repentance. Today is the day for this decision. Not tomorrow, but today. Don't run the risk of losing your place in God's kingdom. Christ warned the church at Ephesus that unless they repented, he would remove their lampstand from its place among the other lampstands. Friend, grace is still available. The grace to forgive you is within your reach. The grace to embrace and revive you is still available. The door of mercy is still open to receive you. The throne of grace is waiting for you. Don't hold back, friend. Don't delay your decision. Accept Christ's invitation to spend eternity with the saints that will eat from the tree of life in a new heaven and a new earth that God will prepare for those who accept His grace. In God's heavenly temple, a door is opened by the intercession. door to heaven will close soon. Jesus, who is grace, will soon rise from his seat and cry
Thank you for the privilege to visit Ephesus, to be reminded of the message of Jesus to this church. We thank you for your encouragement in our lives. We thank you for speaking directly to the changes that need to become reality in our hearts. We pray especially, Lord Jesus, that, that you would give us the gift of repentance, that we would, that we would love you with passion the way we first loved you when we received your grace at the beginning of our Christian journey. Father, continue to guide our lives, make us a blessing to those around us that we would encourage others and that together with them, we would spend eternity with you. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share with your friends and relatives the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ here in Turkey. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you soon again.